This is Pocahontas Cemetery. Abandoned on a wooded hillside overlooking the Athabasca River in Jasper National Park, the cemetery, as well as a dwindling number of ruins just off of Highway 16, are all that remains of a once thriving mining community that precipitated from the coal seams below. Only four headstones bearing the names of those buried there have been placed over the years, while the remaining names have unfortunately been lost to time. Here, the grass grows tall and unkempt within decrepit wooden fences, and sprawling juniper bushes smother the narrow footpath leading to and from these hallowed grounds. Many of those visiting the Maya Hot Springs facility, originally built by the residents of Pocahontas, passed through the old town site on the winding Maya Road unaware of the history buried in these hills, and the role the town played in creating an accessible national park. In 1910, a Minnesota-based company called Jasper Park Collieries opened the Pocahontas Mine on the south side of the Athabasca River, approximately 42 kilometers southwest of present-day Hinton, after two surveyors named Frank Villeneuve and Alfred Lamoureux discovered coal seams at the foot of the iconic Roche Mayette. The site was auspiciously named after another successful mine in Virginia that had in turn taken its moniker from the legendary 17th century figure Pocahontas, whose real name was Matooka, of the Powhatan people. The town of Pocahontas was divided into two primary areas as it continued to expand. Mining operations and communal buildings were relegated to the lower town site closer to the river, while the upper town site served as a residential area which also shared the land of the school and cemetery. Visitors to Jasper National Park can enjoy the interpretive trail which begins at the parking lot just off of Myatt Road from which remnants of the powerhouse, tipple base, and explosives vault can be seen. Other buildings that once stood here included a pool room, post office, Northwest Mounted Police Detachment, machine shop, wash house, ice house, general store, bunkhouse, and mine office. Unlike its neighbor Jasper, Pocahontas also enjoyed the convenience of an on-site physician. Several physicians had provided services to the community over the years, though one Dr. Frank Gray was perhaps the most memorable among residents and had attended the majority of mine casualties as well as those afflicted with illness. About 20 men were initially employed in the construction of preliminary mining works in preparation for the arrival of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway Line which finally arrived at Pocahontas by early 1911, and later Fitzhugh, which was renamed Jasper a few months later. A spur line was eventually constructed from the main rail to the tipple, and the first coal car was loaded in September 1911. For those of you who are unfamiliar with railway and mining terminology, a spur line is a stretch of railway that branches off from the main line and leads to an industry, in this case a coal mine, so that they had direct and efficient access to a means of transportation for their product. A tipple is a structure in which mining carts are parked and tipped so that the product could be loaded directly into rail cars below. This was so significant because it meant that the Grand Trunk no longer had to obtain coal all the way from Crow's Nest Pass south of Calgary or imported from Pennsylvania. In other words, the coal mine at Pocahontas not only facilitated the autonomy of the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway, but also allowed the company to extend its reach. It was also during this time that passenger service makes its debut in Western Canada, which introduced ordinary people to the Rocky Mountains, and probably led to an increased interest in the newly created Federal Nature Reserve that was dubbed Jasper Forest Park after Jasper Hawes of the Northwest Company. Unfortunately for Jasper Park Collieries, its success would be short-lived. In 1916, the dueling railways merged to form the Canadian National Railway, known simply today as CN, and the former Grand Trunk Pacific Line south of the Athabasca River was stripped east of Pocahontas, cutting off the company's direct route to Edmonton. This led to increased shipping costs as coal from the Pocahontas mine had to first make its way to Jasper before being shipped east again along the north side. Other frequent problems plagued Jasper Park collieries, including decreased demand for coal following World War I, coupled with poor coal quality, as well as labor shortages and frequent disputes over working conditions eventually led to the mine's closure in 1921, nine years before the National Parks Act finally outlawed such industries within park boundaries. A major shift in social and economic values from unbridled enthusiasm towards industrial prowess as a form of progress to its condemnation as an intrusive force desecrating the virgin beauty of the Canadian wilderness would inspire a new kind of enterprise in Jasper Forest Park, tourism. One such natural wonder was Punchbowl Falls, not far from the lower Pocahontas town site, as well as the rudimentary hot springs facility built in 1912 by the miners. A road, now Mayette Road, from the site of Pocahontas to the Mayette Hot Springs began construction in 1929, and Highway 16 was paved over the old Grand Trunk Railbed with the ever-growing popularity of the automobile. On April 11, 1933, Jasper Park Collieries officially surrendered their mine lease, and today the site is home to Mayette Mountain Cabins not far from the Pocahontas Campground, which was renamed Mayette Campground in 2022 after Parks Canada cited racist undertones as grounds for the change. 
Still, the memory of Pocahontas as it was and its contributions to Canadian society deserves to be preserved as part of our heritage. A number of death records from the Provincial Archives of Alberta show as many as 13 people buried in the Pocahontas Cemetery, with the addition of John Proddy, who was later buried there in 2000. Their names include John Reed and his infant son, Kate Wasuda, Lucy Gildia, George Francis Williams, John Lee, Loretta Rose Wrigley, Maria Proddy, Frank Lombardo, Dora Thurwell, Daniel McLeod, Rosie Nikiforuk, Charles Arthur Joseph Violet, Louis Ernest Jolicoeur, and John Proddy. Others who may have possibly been interred here as well include Arthur Owen Davies, Anna Jemima Russell, Dennis Gildia Jr., Peter White, Adelaide Elizabeth Colombo, Robert Thompson, William Greig Barclay, Placciolo Giacchino, John Archie Livingstone, John B. McLeod, and Carmine Pauletti. Some were not as fortunate, however, and did not receive a proper burial. In January 1914, three men with surnames Antonio, Barrero, and Rosardo were erecting power lines across the Athabasca River to the Mayat mine when all three drowned. Their bodies have not been recovered to this day. When asked to provide a statement, Steve Mario recalled the following to Constable Parker of the Northwest Mounted Police. On the morning of the 6th, Saturday, we were going to work on the north side of the river. I was in front, and as I did not think the ice was good, I tried it with my foot. When the other three came up, I told them not to cross there as the ice was not good. One of them, I do not know his name, tried it and the ice broke under him. Then one of the other two tried to help him out and was pulled in. Then the third tried to help them out and was also pulled in. Then I tried to pull the other three out, and they pulled me in. I caught one, my left elbow on the ice, and they had hold of my right hand. Their hands were wet and slipped, and then they caught the corner of my coat, but could not hold on. I was then in the water up to my chest. I managed to get out, and when I looked for them, I could just see the hand of the man who went in first. He went under the ice almost at once, before I could help him. Another drowning occurred on November 25, 1917, when a miner, Campbell McPherson, likely tried to cross the river over the ice in the same manner. The river was dragged, and dynamite was used to help bring the body to the surface, but the recovery efforts proved unsuccessful. Perhaps one day the toil and sacrifice of the residents of Pocahontas will be forever enshrined in Canadian history, and their names remember fondly as those who made it possible for the world to experience the beauty of Jasper National Park. For now, I'd like to thank a few people for making this video possible. I received a lot of help pursuing this passion over the past couple of years, and would like to acknowledge the following. Richie Sue Allen of the Library and Archives Canada, Karen Byers of the Jasper Yellowhead Museum and Archives, Mike Eater of Parks Canada, Glynis Homan of the Provincial Archives of Alberta, Amelia Hunter of the Parks Canada National Library, Mitchell Leonard also of the Parks Canada National Library, Karen Simonson of the Provincial Archives of Alberta, as well as everyone volunteering at the Provincial Archives. Thank you so much for all your help and support. Again, this video would not have been possible without you.